All right, so it's time for the third and last talk of the morning, which will be given by Marcus Flaum of the University of Colorado in Boulder, and he will talk about the Hochschild homology of convolution algebra of properly group weights. Marcus. Yeah, thank you, Henry. First, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak at this wonderful birthday conference. And also let me send my happy birthday wishes to cyclic homology theory. My talk is about the Hochschild homology of convolution algebras of proper legal points, and it is joint work uh, with Hazel Postuma and Chang Tang. <coughs> let me start with a well-known observation, namely that groupoids are ubiquitous in topology and geometry, and that all the relevant information about groupoids is contained in their convolution algebra that has been very nicely and in detail being explained in Kahn's book on non-commutative geometry. So in particular, in view of the title of the birthday conference, um, one goal definitely is to determine the cyclic homology and cohomology theory of convolution algebras of proper legal points. And this is a project Hessel and Chang have been working on for many years. And um, one of the reasons why we consider this is not only because it's interesting by itself, but also because um, hopefully on the long run, uh, one can obtain knowledge to derive more channel index theorems for groupoids by non-commutative means. So um, what is the status of this? So many uh, people have worked on this. Uh, the full cyclic cohomology theory of convolution algebras has not been determined yet, but many important and uh, difficult steps have been obtained so far. And I have here a long list of names, Kahn, Feigen, Zügen, Brulinski, Nistor, Bugella, Bloch, Getzler, Wassermann, Nest, Kreinig, Murdaid, and Ponge, and several um, have given or will give talks at this conference. So what I will talk about today is about the Hochschild homology of a particular groupoid, namely about um, circle actions on uh, smooth manifolds. And we have a, a preprint on the archive, which is uh, listed here below. So now for the setup, assume that G over M is a proper legal point. S and T are its source and target maps as usual. And then consider its smooth convolution algebra. So in principle, this consists of the smooth functions with compact support on the error space G. And the product is given by the convolution, convolution product, which is denoted here um, in this formula. It's well-known extension from the convolution product on, on, a, on a group or on a group action. Uh, this lambda over which you integrate is a fixed smooth left har system on G. In principle, you could also use uh, half densities so that you don't have to choose a fixed uh, left har system, but this is equivalent. Some formulas become slightly easier if you do it that way, so we go that route. Now, and uh, what is the, the main, or are the main questions? Um, what are? the Hochschild homology of this convolution algebra, what is the cyclic homology and what's the periodic cyclic homology. And as mentioned before, um, partial answers have been given, but the full result um, has not been obtained yet. Okay, let me recall, and actually this is a connection with the previous talk by Joachim Kunz, the hochschild kostan rosenberg theorem, and then Kahn's version of it, so I can be brief. Assume A is the commutative algebra over a field K, which is essentially a finite type, which means that the location, it is the location of a finitely generated algebra and smooth over K. Um, one way to say that is it's more of Keller forms is a projective A module. Um, an equivalent definition has been given in, in, in Kunz's talk. And then there is an isomorphism of graded algebras, namely uh, between the Hochschild homology of A and um, the, the, the complex of higher Kähler forms. 
Okay. There's a manifold version, which uh, was proved uh, by Alain Kohn. So assume that M is a smooth manifold and A is the algebra of smooth uh, functions on the manifold, then the Hochschild homology coincides um, with the differential forms on M. This observation lies at the foundation of non-commutative geometry. Let me briefly uh, recall and I, I recall this also because I will need this later in the talk that um, the fundamental method to prove that equivalence of these two uh, graded vector spaces is uh, by a resolution which I call or one calls con cosul resolution and it will be later used in this talk as well. Let me now come actually to um, in a certain sense to Masood's question about singularities. This is a little side remark to my talk. I will not uh, explain many more details on this, but I want to mention a result, namely by Aframov, Ienga, Rodicu, Vigoué, Poirier, and several others, um, which is a kind of inverted comma converse of the Husserl, Costa, and Rosenberg theorem. So one important consequence about the uh, Hochschild Kost and Rosenberg theorem is that smoothness of the underlying variety implies that the Hochschild homology vanishes in high enough degree. Now, there is another uh, converse, so to speak. If you have a commutative algebra essentially of finite type, then A is smooth over K if and only if the Hochschild homology vanishes for a sufficiently large degree. So there are algebras where you have infinitely many non-vanishing degrees of, in the Hochschild homology. That implies by this result that there are singularities. So the conclusion of this observation is that Hochschild homology serves as it is. Oh, oh sorry, what is that? We cannot hear you. Yeah, yeah, it's. So I unmuted my. Oh, okay. No, you are not. Can you hear me now again? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, the Hochschild homology therefore can serve as a detector for singularities. Actually, I have a conjecture, and uh, this is another. Um, area of research I'm doing in regard to cyclic homology theory, namely um, by looking at several examples like orbit spaces of compact legal actions, it looks like that Hochschild homology can even serve as a detector for strata or more precisely serve as an invariant for uh, strata. Yeah, so there, there has been no publication out yet on this, um, but some preliminary results and I hope um, to uh, be able to work that out a bit more in the future. Okay, now let's come back to um, proper Likor points in the convolution algebras. Actually, one important step um, to make progress in this program of understanding the cyclic homology theory of uh, Likor points is to shifify the convolution algebra. One problem with this is that the standard definition um, works with smooth functions on the aerospace with compact support. So um, this is difficult to shifify. So you have to slightly change um, the algebra under consideration and, and we, we do this as follows. So first we look at the orbit space of uh, that legal point and pi is the canonical projection. Now observe that this orbit space is actually a differentiable space in the sense of Spalik, or even a differentiable stratified space. So that it has a canonical stratification has been proved by um, Hessel, Postuma, Shangtang, and myself. So what it means is that locally you can embed X into some Euclidean space and it, it carries a um, canonical uh, minimal Whitney stratification. Okay, and then you have a sheaf of commutative algebras. And now for the convolution sheaf, so to speak, assume U is open 
open X, then you look at all smooth functions on the pre-image uh, S inverse pi inverse of U. So essentially this consists of all arrows such that their projection of their source and target lies in this open set U. And we assume that this, the support of F is longitudinally compact, which essentially means that along the orbit direction it's compact, but what happens transversely to the orbit, there is no restriction. Yeah. And that allows to Shifify the convolution algebra. And um, here's the precise definition, what longitudinally compact means. It's essentially um, yeah, that a certain intersection with those uh, orbits is compact. The convolution product I had um, presented before in a very canonical way um, can be also defined on the section spaces a few simply because you integrate over orbits and by this condition, um, the orbits are fully contained and the support at, of an F or, or of two functions F1 and F2 on these orbits is compact. So you can integrate and everything works out nicely. Okay, so what does one get? Um, so the result is if you have a proper leakopoid x its orbit space, then the following holds true. The assignment u goes over to a of u um, is a fine chief of algebras over x. Fine essentially means that you have a partition of unity. And one reason why, or the reason why it's a fine chief is actually contained in the second point, the sheaf a is and a C infinity X module sheaf. So over each section space, the A of U is a module over C infinity of U, where C infinity of U comes from this structure sheaf on this orbit space X. And obviously C infinity of X has a partition of unity and that, um, well, gives a partition of unity for the sheaf A. Now the original, Convolution algebra is then the space of global sections of that sheaf with compact support. But you obviously have also um, the global section space without restrictions to the compact support. And we also call this smooth convolution algebra. And this is the algebra where we are interested in and want to compute its cyclic homology of, or Hochschild homology, actually. So now, um, again, a is assumed to be the convolution sheaf of a proper leucopoid. And um, we not only did we want to sheafify the convolution algebra, we also want to sheafify the Hochschild chain complex to be able to localize Hochschild homology at orbits and look at the corresponding stocks. So, what we, did we do here? And actually we borrowed ideas from Hochschild homology over algebraic varieties. So what we have here is the, the pre-sheaf CK of A, it's defined on X and it's defined as follows. If U is an open subset of the orbit space, you take the K times completed phonological tensor product. So here again, I would like to mention bonologies. It has been mentioned in, in Ralph's talk. And again, here it's actually really crucial to use bonological tensor products because it, it is the one which fits perfectly. And with those section spaces A of U, the uh, projective and inductive tensor product in the topological setting might not agree. Yeah? Therefore, you really need to um, use a very reasonable tensor product and the Bernard logical one is exactly the right one. Now, you associate for each U this tensor product A of U um, to the tensor power K. In general, you do not um, obtain a sheaf by that. Actually, I just see it should be K plus one, but okay, uh, that's a just a shift, which is necessary. So this so defined CK of A is just a pre-sheaf. And what one has to do is one has to sheafify and then one gets CK roof of A, 
it's the sheafification of that sheaf. And now what's relatively easy to check is that the Hochschild boundary commutes with restriction maps. So therefore one obtains a complex of sheaves. This is the Hochschild chain, sheaves of Hochschild chains of A. And now you can form the Hochschild homology as a sheaf. And this this double script A, uh, uh, double script H of A. And uh, in this lower formula, it's defined, the precise definition is given in the sheaf sense. So the important thing is that you have to understand all of this in the sheaf sense. Now, what's the virtue of this? Now you can look at the stock. So what are the, um, the foot points of the stocks? These are orbits, in other words, elements of X. And you can now look at um, script H, H, K of A at or O. And you later can compare this um, with and try to see how much information can get about the Hochschild homology of the global section space. But as pointed out here, the, the stock of this Hochschild homology sheaf coincides by definition with the Hochschild homology of the stock AO, yeah, where A is the convolution sheaf. Now, there's a crucial observation that if you have an arbitrary sheaf of chronological algebras, or actually just in general of algebras over a, a, a space, then um, the Hochschild homology of the global section space might not coincide with the space of global sections of the homology sheaf. Yeah? This is not particular to Hochschild homology sheaves, that's just in general for um, sheaf complexes. Yeah? So this does not commute. And by the way, just as a side remark, that's one of the reasons why um, one has hyper homology theory, which um, in a certain sense um, tries to take care of the uh, look into the obstruction where these two um, functors commute. Now, Hazel, Shang, and myself proved that in the case of a, a convolution sheaf, the situation is actually nice. There, you, you have a kind of commutativity result. The Hochschild homology of the global section space, which is the convolution algebra of the proper legal groupoid, can be recovered as the global section space of the Hochschild homology sheaf. Yeah. What I would like to do now is to give a little outline of the proof of this localization result and um, then continue. Let me mention that this method of localization differs um, to the localization uh, Victor Nistor mentioned in his talk where it was a kind of localization at consciousy classes. Uh, we localize here at orbits. And the fundamental idea of this way of localization actually goes back to Nikola Telemann. And I find this a very beautiful localization method and actually very powerful. And as a side remark, uh, I would like to mention that we use this um, Brasley and myself used this kind of uh, Telemann localization also to prove our um, Whitney function version of the feigen zugen theorem. That's just as a side remark um, or reference to um, Kunz's talk before my talk. So the localization, the first component just means you multiply um, a chain in its first coordinate with a smooth function on that orbit space X, and it's very easy to show that this localization in the first coordinate commutes with boundary maps. Then localization around the diagonal, that's actually what goes back to Tillman and that's the more complicated stuff. So what you do here is you just take a smooth cutoff function rho. It has support um, in the interval from negative infinity to up to three fourth and is assumed to be one for all R, for all um, R less or equal than one half. And um, yeah, 
Okay, and then what you do is you scale this row and define row epsilon, where epsilon is just an arbitrary positive number as rho of s divided by epsilon squared. Now, the next step is define cutoff functions, psi k epsilon, which are written down here. As you see, they are essentially products of distances squared, um, where as ingredients, you have the xj and xj plus one, meaning neighboring coordinates, yeah? That means the support of this psi k epsilon is in kind of an epsilon neighborhood of the diagonal. If you go way out, the whole thing um, from the diagonal, this psi k epsilon vanishes and it's smooth. The important thing is that this metric D you choose uh, needs to be smooth, but by locally embedding X into some RN, just take the restriction of some Euclidean metric. So that's, this is not a, it's more a technical detail. Okay, these psi k epsilon from a chain map, yeah, that's uh, a bit technical, but not really difficult. And the fundamental observation now is that there are homotopies, HK epsilon, between the identity operator and, and multiplication with those psi epsilons. Yeah. Those homotopies are constructed actually out of those psi case or are similarly constructed like the psi case. So what is the consequence out of this? The consequence out of this is that if you have a cycle whose support is not, uh, does not meet the diagonal, then it is actually a Hochschild boundary. So anything which happens outside the diagonal is not relevant. Yeah? And that is the crucial thing for this localization result. Okay, out of this, out of the previous steps, one verifies that this map, which maps um, a chain of the global algebra A to um, the global section where you localize at each orbit and you look at all the, the family of all those localizations and they are form obviously a section in the, in the Hochschild, a sheaf of Hochschild chains that turns out to be a quasi isomorphism because of the previous steps. Okay, and then just using some standards methods from hypercology of sheaves and that um, this complex C roof of A is a complex of fine sheaves that then entails a claim that you can kind of commute the global sections uh, functor with a, a Hochschild functor. Okay. Now, uh, one consequence out of this localization risk is the following. Now, you fix, you look at a fixed orbit of the liquid and then it turns out that there is a quasi-isomorphism, namely be between the Hochschild chief, the sheaf of Hochschild chains, at that localized at that orbit O, and the Hochschild chain complex of A G X acting on NXO. I need to explain briefly the ingredients here. So GX, that is the isotropy group at X of that group point. It acts in a canonical way on the normal space to the orbit through the point X. So we actually have a linear compact leap action on NXO. You can form the corresponding convolution algebra. That is this A G X acting on NXO. Yeah, so this is a convolution algebra here. That's again a convolution algebra. And that actually, well, you can form its uh, complex of Hochschild chains. And our localization result entails that these two chain complexes are quasi-isomorphic. So in principle, what does this uh, mean is that you can reduce at the stocks the computation of the Hochschild homology just to the case of a linear compact lead action on some Euclidean space, yeah? 
So and this is uh, this conclusion here. Um, if you want to understand the host homology of proper leukopoids, it is crucial and necessary that you first understand what is the Hochschild homology of compact Lego actions on uh, linear on, on, on Euclidean space. Yeah? There is a second point. You need then in the second step to glue together uh, what happens at the stocks. That's non-trivial, um, but you, you cannot do that second step before the first. Yeah. Anyway, um, this is the main message now. You really have to understand first the, the case of compact Lie group actions, and it will give very crucial information. So now a lot of work has been done on the group action case, and you recall um, what has been done in the finite group action case first. So um, I apologize if I uh, did not, cannot mention or do not mention everybody who has contributed, but I just picked out a couple of important um, papers. So Wasserman, to my knowledge, was one of the first who looked into the uh, cyclic homology case for the case of finite reflection groups. There is a short article by his where uh, this has been studied. Um, the finite group action case was, to my knowledge, first fully covered in the paper by Berlinski nistor on the cyclic homology theory of equal group points. So they have a kind of, um, yeah, they, essentially their paper covers the finite group action case. And um, Raphael Ponch has recently, um, compared to the other papers recently, um, constructed a quasi-isomorphism of twisted mixed complexes from which the finite group action case can also be derived. And um, to my understanding, he will also give a talk about this subject at this conference. So I refer to his talk for details about that. And now in the, in the compact Lie group action case, or um, Nistor in 93 gave a, um, a localization of periodic cyclic homology of cross products by algebraic groups at conjugacy, conjugacy classes. And I would like to refer also to his uh, talk at this conference. And now let me come to Berlinski's paper. So he has a, a, an unpublished preprint, algebras associated with group actions and their homology from 87. And he compa uh, considered compact Lie group actions on manifolds and stated that the case Hochschild homology group coincides with the space of basic relative forms. I will explain in a minute what those basic relative forms are. Um, this is a very beautiful paper. Um, it has been circulated only um, yeah, as a preprint, never has been published. And the argument Berlinski um, provides that the Hochschild homology coincides with this basic relative forms contains a gap. And in the work with Hessel and Chang, we tried to fill this gap and we succeeded in the case of S1 actions, but um, an idea how to do it in the channel case, but it is not yet fully filled. And I will explain um, in a couple of minutes where the problem lies. Um, related to Berlinski's work is the work by Block and Getzler. They also consider compact Lie group actions, but they and, and construct an equivalent Hochschild Kost and Rosenberg map, um, where from which they derive the isomorphism um, in the and the, uh, the computation of the periodic cyclic homology of convolutional algebras in this case. Okay, now. Um, let me go a little bit into some technicalities. So we assume to be given a complete bornological algebra with a smooth G action. Actually, um, smoothness is more logical than a topological concept, but that's uh, only a side remark. And we look at uh, the G X from the left on this algebra B. So the convolution algebra, again, um, meaning the smooth functions from G to B with uh, the convolution product exactly defined as before. And uh, then Berlinski observed that the Hochschild homology of this algebra is related to the equivalent Hochschild chain complex. What is that? This consists of the smooth functions from G to the tensor power of E 
um, and the invariant part equipped with the twisted Hochschild differential. That is um, essentially the Hochschild differential. Um, I mean, here you have the standard Hochschild differential face maps, but here you have a twisted one. Yeah, so this is this is twisted. And here is the definition of the twist one. The others are standard, so I did not write them down. Okay, in our case, what is B? B is the uh, algebra of smooth functions on the object space of this transformation group. Point. Okay, and then Berlinski proved in 97, and we reproved it with a, a few more details that if you have given a complete bronological algebra B, with a smooth G action, then the Allenberg silver map induces a quasi isomorphism between the Hochschild chain complex of this convolutional algebra and this equivalent Hochschild chain complex. One can actually even write down explicitly a formula for this um, quasi isomorphism, and this is given here below. Um, yeah, and it's uh, a bit technical, but uh, very useful and actually crucial. Okay, now let me come to a twisted uh, kahn hochschild kostand rosenberg theorem, um, which is known, but um, we have given a proof which I think is closer to Kahn's originally, uh, original proof of the manifold version of the hochschild kostand rosenberg theorem, and uh, different to the berlinski nista proof, for example. Therefore, I provide it here. So the first thing is uh, you assume H is an orthogonal transformation on some Euclidean space. V is an open ball around the origin, actually, that needs to be uh, added here. And um, H, the infinity of V is the algebra of smooth functions on V, but with the H twisted bimodule structure written down here. So if you multiply from the left, then you insert in the domain, you insert here HV, yeah? So that's the twist. So this is twisted and this is untwisted. So from the left-hand side, this is twisted from the right, it's untwisted. Okay, and now um, how do you compute this twisted Hochschild homology? And there you use just the kahn crossul resolution um, introduced by Kahn, um, where you have these, um, section spaces of V cross V into E um, in the bundle ED, which is a pullback um, of forms on RD via the projection on the second coordinate. Yeah, so V cross V is projected under the second coordinate and then you take the, the, the forms on that second coordinate. And Y is actually just inserting this difference vector field. Okay, this gives another a projective resolution of C infinity of V as a C infinity V bi module. So you can compute with that the, the Hochschild homology, this one here, yeah? Okay, now you answer this resolution with uh, the twisted um, bi module H C infinity of V, yeah? So tensor, with H C infinity of V. And then you um, get this twisted um, kahn hochschild kostand rosenberg theorem. So let V H be the fixed point um, manifold in V and you can embed that via Yota H, but you also can, because in principle, I mean, these are balls, but in principle, you can extend that to linear subspaces. So you have a canonical projection from V to VH, uh, the canonical orthogonal projection. And you can also, I mean, by tensoring with this H C infinity V, the, the original um, vector field Y goes into this twisted vector field YH, which in principle is only the difference between V and minus HV. It has, obviously, it vanishes exactly on VH, on the fixed point submanifold. Yeah, and as it turns out, the, um, by pulling back forms via IH or pi H, one gets quasi-isomorphisms. Yeah, so um, by the previous result here, um, this computes 
the Hochschule homology. Yeah? So this computes HH. And you still have here non-zero differentials, but because this is quasi-isomorphic to the forms on the VH, and there the differential is zero, that is then the homology, the Hochschule homology. Okay, and so therefore um, one gets obtains the result, the kth Hochschild homology of C infinity V with values in the twisted module is exactly or coincide with the forms on VH. Okay, this, um, by the way, just um, some remarks concerning Berlinski. Berlinski kind of stated this and he has a reference um, that of the sort, this it was long known and uh, refers to uh, to uh, Deram, but unfortunately I could not find, um, I looked in many papers of Deram by now, but I could not find exactly where that claim was made. That was one of the reasons why um, Hessel and Chung and myself uh, gave this kind of direct proof of this twisted uh, CHKR theorem. Anyway, and the important observation here is um, later on, this H should be an element of a compact Lie group. But this VH does not continuously depend on H. Yeah, so you, you can have chumps in the dimension of this VH, and that, that is the gap I, I uh, mentioned before. And the problem. So this quasi-isomorphism, so to speak, is not, does not depend continuously on H. Actually, I don't even know how to make sense of uh, um, saying that this quasi-isomorphism depends continuously, yeah? So for discrete groups, all is fine and recovers the well-known um, Hochschild and cyclic homology theory for finite group actions or proper Italy group points out of this. But as soon as you are in a compact Lie group with dimension, with positive dimension, this will not, this will not completely work. Okay, now let's come to uh, the uh, definition of the inertia group point and inertia spaces and the basic relative forms. So the inertia or loop space is defined, well, just as the space of all loops. So you have um, arrows which having the same source and target. And the groupoid acts by conjugation on that loop space. Therefore, you get another groupoid called the inertia groupoid. Let me mention here, in general, this is not a legal point. This is very important. Um, it is a legal point in the etal case, yeah. But if it's not etal, this is actually a differentiable stratified space, uh, di differentiable stratified group point, as has been pointed out in um, a work jointly with Carla Farsi and Chris Seaton. The orbit space of that group point is often called the inertia space. In the particular example where um, the groupoid is an action groupoid, it's the lambda, the loop space is just the disjoint union of the fixed point manifolds. Yeah, so each uh, pair GP um, consists of uh, a group element G and the element in the object space um, M, such that GP is P. And you take all these unions. And uh, obviously this is a subspace of G cross M. This is uh, actually a pretty interesting space by itself. If the original legal point was proper etal, then the connected components of the loop space are again manifolds. And the corresponding inertia group point is then again proper etal and the inertia space is an orbifold. That is kind of well known, but if in general, this unfortunately not holds, it does not hold true, but what one knows is that the loop space and the inertia space are both locally semi-algebraic. So in particularly, they have a canonical minimal witness stratification, meaning decomposition in, in locally finitely many 
um, uh, manifolds which uh, meet in a nice way. That's this Whitney condition B. In work with uh, Farsi and Seton, I could uh, provide a Whitney stratification of that loop space, but we don't know yet whether it's always the minimal one. Yeah, we call it the orbit Carton type stratification, and it's actually pretty. Um, it's a pretty co complicated stratification. It's more complicated than the st standard orbit type stratification. Okay, uh, now let me just uh, actually draw here um, an example. So you assume you have S1 acting on R2, the standard circle action. And what would be the corresponding inertia space? So here you have the plane. Assume here is the origin. And the inertia space would be then just Assume the circle goes around here at infinity and comes back here. So in principle, you have the R2 plane and the circle intersects that plane just in the origin and goes around at infinity, yeah? So you have one singular point that's here. And the interesting observation is this is not an algebraic variety. It's semi-algebraic, but not, but not algebraic. Yeah. And it's also not an orbit space. Oh, let me, sorry, let me just hear, um, let me just, uh, it's actually the important thing, it's not an orbit space. That's the algebra, it's, okay, so it's not an orbit space. Therefore, because it's not an orbit space, it does not have a canonical orbit uh, stratification. Now we, let's come to the forms. So the space of relative forms on the loop space is defined in the sense of grauert grotendieck namely what you look at, you take the forms on M, you pull them back to forms on um, G cross M via the source map. And then you what you have to mod out, um, and that's the grauert grotendieck idea. To get a differential graded algebra, you not only have to mod out the vanishing ideals uh, times the forms, but also the differential times the forms. But here you have to take the relative differential because you have pulled back um, forms on T star M. So in principle, you have to pull back the D on M. Um, this is, a, I mean, because it's a product, G cross M is a product. This is not a big deal in the case of a transformation group point. It becomes more so a problem in the case of a channel legal point, but I put that aside. So again, uh, J lambda zero is the vanishing ideal of the loop space and you get forms. Um, these are the so-called uh, horizontal uh, forms. No, the relative forms. The horizontal relative forms are those which become zero when you insert the fundamental vector field associated to some Lie, Lie algebra element Xi. And the basic relative forms are just the invariant part. Yeah, just um, uh, take here in the invariant part. So actually, this is quite an, um, a complicated definition of uh, certain types of forms. Berlinski has um, not really used Grauert Grotendieck's language, but I think this is the right way to do it. And in a paper from 2017, um, Hessel Postuma and Chang Tang and myself uh, explained that uh, in, in some more detail. Okay, and now uh, we come to Brulinski's conjecture. Um, the first thing is um, it, you have a map from this equivalent Hochschild chain complex to those relative forms. We call this capital Phi. And in principle, is you take um, K plus one. Um, the, the K plus one tensor products of um, the five Fi's and um, you pull them back via the source map and then you take the differential of the last K ones and multiply it with F, F naught. 
and restrict that. So this is actually a restriction map here. Restrict that to um, to the inertia, uh, to the loop space, and therefore get a, a relative form out. And the conjecture by Brolinsky, I call it conjecture, even though there it was written a, a proposition, but um, is that this chain map phi is a quasi isomorphism. And by this previous result that the equivalent Hochschild um, chains give you the Hochschild homology of the convolution algebra, if you can prove this, you take the invariant part of the left hand side and the invariant part of the right hand side, then you get a description of the Hochschild homology of the um, of the convolution algebra in terms of basic relative forms. Yeah. So if you can prove that, um, then you are done. Okay. Berlinski's conjecture has been verified in the fo following cases, actually independently uh, of the. Uh, I mean, some stuff even appeared before. In the finite group action case, it is goes back to Berlinski and Nistor, and then later Brodsky, Dave, and Nistor. Um, if the action has only one isotropy type. My impression is that this has been kind of folklore, but uh, we um, stated and, and gave an outline in our uh, recent preprint. And the circle action case that was covered in full uh, in our paper. So what is the problem um, to prove this is that this, as mentioned before, the, the Kohn-Hochschild constant Rosenberg quasi-isomorphism in the twisted case does not depend continuously on the transformation H. Yeah, so you have to uh, you have to address that problem somehow. And the second thing is the complicated singular structure of the inertia space. Yeah, it's it's not a, a compact Lie space of a compact Lie group action. It's semi-algebraic and in general not algebraic. So this is pretty complicated. So um, let me just in the last couple of minutes um, give. Um, course outline how we address the circle action case without going into detail. So the first thing is has been kind of mentioned a couple of times to reduce the linear circle action by the slice theorem and localization. Uh, you, you reduce the circle action case to a linear circle action case by the slice theorem and localization. And um, so there are essentially two cases. Um, you, you need to look at the isotropic groups, which can appear there either finite or S1. So what you have to look at are um, finite subgroup actions uh, of S1 on some linear space. So that's covered by existing results and then S1 actions on some R2N. So this is the, the crucial part is then this case here. Yeah, um, you, we have to look at the isotropic group uh, where the isotropic group is S1, for example, um, and that in, in other words means where S1 acts on some even dimensional Euclidean space. Again, you use the con Kosul resolution to get an expression for the homology of um, this twisted homology or equivalent homology. And now, and that is where the novelty I think comes in, we use methods from real algebraic geometry. Uh, because you have to, you have to really write down nice generators of this vanishing ideal of that inertia space or the loop space, and also then this twisted vector field y h. You then have to express that in terms of those generators, and we partially use complex coordinates but always several methods from real algebraic geometry and in particular Malgrange's preparation theorem to locally describe the, this vanishing ideal. Yeah, so the vanishing ideal J lambda naught. Yeah, and that was, is technically pretty involving, um, but you have to, you, you really have to use such methods uh, because you need somehow to incorporate the dependence the dependency of this derivative by insertion of yh in terms of h. Okay, and 
putting all of this together, um, then you can finally identify the, the homology, this equivalent quotient homology with a graded vector space of horizontal relative forms. Okay, I think um, I'm exactly on time, so I close my talk. Thank you. You're muted, Henry. You should unmute yourself. Disappeared. Okay, no, no, I, I reappeared. I, I was muted. So 